I've made several videos in the past about how to optimize your privacy settings in your browsers, as well as steps to harden your Linux OS against potential security threats and optimizing privacy with encrypted DNS. But I haven't yet covered the best way to really protect your overall online privacy against large companies and three-letter government agencies alike. You see, companies like Apple, Google, and Amazon don't just create one-off products that you can use, they've created entire tech ecosystems that they control. And they also use these tech ecosystems to lure in naive users that just see a shiny new product that they want to buy without considering the ways in which these companies use the shiny new products to control them. For example, if you're integrated into the Apple ecosystem, that means that you're probably using a MacBook, an iPhone, Apple's messaging application, their email service, and possibly even their credit card. With Amazon, you have a single company that knows all of your shopping decisions, what type of shows and books you like to enjoy, the food that you like to buy if you're shopping at Whole Foods, the conversations that are going on inside your house, and the data and services that you have hosted on AWS. Or if you're not creating AWS applications yourself and you're merely an end user of them, then they very likely also have some of the data that you're sending through that AWS service. You see, when you use a single company for all of these different activities, then you are quite literally giving that company control over all those activities and control over you when you participate in those activities, as well as revealing a significant amount of information about you. These companies obviously have the data from each individual activity, but the links that these companies can make from these various data points paint a much better picture about who you are for them. If you're using something produced by these companies everywhere that you go, then they can track you more closely, more precisely, as well as send you more targeted advertisements. So the real key to protecting your online privacy is to not centralize yourself to a single tech ecosystem as well as to avoid tech ecosystems which abuse your trust and sell your data in the first place. So I'm going to walk you through a stack of software and services that you can use which do just that. They respect your privacy and they don't sell your data to other companies to use for advertising. For your search engine, I would recommend using DuckDuckGo or StartPage. Personally, DuckDuckGo is my preferred search engine. They don't track you, and they also don't manipulate search results, which is crucial if you're trying to research something controversial or if you're doing research about virtually any political candidate ever. Now, using a privacy-respecting search engine instead of Google or Bing is pretty much pointless if you're still going to be using a browser that is made by one of those same companies behind those search engines. So Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, and even Safari are going to be a no-go. So what type of browser should you use then? For the normies, I recommend the Brave browser. It's Chromium-based, which is fine because Chromium is at least open source, I know a lot of people hate on Chromium because it is a Google project at the end of the day, but Chromium-based browsers are still more user-friendly and thus better for the normies. And Brave comes pre-configured out of the box with some fairly optimized privacy settings, so it takes very little effort to stop tracking. There's not really much of anything that you have to change, which again is great for the normies. What I really recommend though to step up your browser's privacy is to use Firefox and then configure it to have optimized privacy settings. Sure, this is a little bit more work and more complicated than simply installing a browser and just opening it up and continuing on with your web surfing, but I have several videos that walk you through optimizing Firefox's privacy settings that should reduce some of that complexity for you. So if you're willing to put in a little bit of effort to have better privacy, then this is the way to go for your browser. 
Another thing to note about browsers is cookie storage. Most browsers by default will store cookies, including Brave, which could be used to track you. So it's important to not just modify the tool that you are using to browse the internet, but also the way that you browse the internet. So instead of using cookies to remember things like passwords and login details, use a password manager instead. It's also smart to avoid sites that use excessive JavaScript or better yet to block JavaScript altogether in your browser. This is going to make a lot of websites not work though. So for sites that are bloated by JavaScript that you absolutely must use, it might be better to access them through Tor so that at the very least your IP will be hidden as well as most of your user agent information or going through the Tor network is too slow. You could again use Firefox, but with multiple browser profiles that are configured for privacy. That way, when you're doing specific types of online browsing, like online shopping, watching YouTube videos, and doing research, it's going to be harder to link all of those together, especially if you use a proxy or a VPN to mask your IP address as well when you're doing that browsing. Now that our browsers are secure, we want to go ahead and secure our operating system because running a highly secured privacy respecting browser inside of an OS that doesn't do the same like Windows or the Mac OS is kind of pointless. The only real solution here is going to be Linux or BSD. Both of these operating systems are open source. You can get a little bit more extreme with Linux by only using software from the Free Software Foundation's list of approved software. Now, it should be noted that applications which are not on the SFSF's approved list are not necessarily bad for privacy and security. They simply don't comply with the FSF's Puritan approach to software. Usually, they're getting excluded from their list because they contain some non-free blobs within the code, or the OSs will get excluded by simply recommending non-free software. And if you really want to go off of the deep end with Linux, you could use a source-based distribution like Gentoo, because if you compile all of your packages from source locally yourself, you can create unique binaries that are going to be harder to compromise by hackers. And also you can be more sure that no malicious code has been built into the binaries that you're using if you compile it yourself instead of letting somebody else do it like on binary based distributions. Now we have your desktop and laptop secure, but what do we do about your phone? These are devices that we carry around with us, and most people these days use their phone more often than their computer. So what do we do about phones? Well, as far as phones go, it can be a little tricky because smartphones were designed long after governments and corporations realized the tracking and surveillance potential of technology. The most extreme solution, and also the best one for ensuring privacy, is to simply not use a smartphone. Regardless of whether you use Apple, Android, a Librem 5 phone, or even an old school flip phone, the device can still be used to track you because of how cellular technology works. In order for your phone to maintain its cellular connection and use things like GPS and location services, your phone needs to constantly send messages back and forth between the cell phone towers on Earth and the GPS satellites in space. And all of this data is collected and stored by the companies and the governments who control these systems. So there really isn't any way to prevent this tracking other than simply not using a cell phone at all. But if you want to continue using your smartphone, there are some things that we can do to mitigate the tracking that is done by them. First, I would recommend using an Android phone instead of an iPhone, because by default, Android gives you more access to settings and the ability to sideload applications. 
because we really don't want to be loading all of our apps from the built-in store that is run by the same company who built our phone. There's also the potential for compartmentalization with Android because your phone's OS and your phone's hardware are not necessarily going to be made by the same company. You see, Apple doesn't release the code for iOS or the Mac OS, so if you want to use this software, you're restricted to using it on Apple's hardware. Android, on the other hand, is an open source project that is led by Google. So you don't necessarily have to use a Google phone to have Android on it. You could use a phone that's built by Samsung, Sony, or OnePlus. So this variety of the hardware also creates more competition. And more competition is going to create better phones at a better price in the Android space than in the Apple space. Once you have your Android phone, I recommend installing F-Droid and using that as your app store instead of the built-in Play Store. Unlike the Play Store, F-Droid doesn't require a Google account to download applications. It also has access to applications that are far superior to apps on the Google Play Store, like Bromite, NewPipe, and DNS 6.6 all of which are essential for having secure browsing, YouTubing, and blocking ads through DNS, respectively. Also, the default repository in Ftroid is a Libre repository, meaning that they only recommend free and open source applications to you by default. Of course, you can still download non-free, non-open source applications, but this isn't really gonna be recommended to keep with the whole privacy respecting idea. Finally, there is email. Email itself is a somewhat outdated technology, but it is still necessary to sign up for a lot of things since many online services still require an email address. You obviously don't want to use something like Gmail or Hotmail because that doesn't fall in line with our compartmentalization. You also shouldn't use services like Yahoo Mail, which has been hacked several times in the past. So what should you use? My recommendation would be Tutanota or ProtonMail. Both have encryption built into them. The providers are unable to read the content of any of your emails. They can only see the sender's email address, the recipient's email address, and the date that the email was sent. Both of these companies are also in fairly good jurisdictions as far as legality is concerned. So if they do get subpoenaed by their respective governments, which is less likely than governments like the United States, um, they're already encrypted. So there's not really much that they can hand over to those agencies anyway. So these are both free email services that I would recommend using for online accounts that you really care about and accounts that you may need to recover a password for. Now, most of our online accounts are actually not that important. I've had this experience countless times where I'll be on a forum or a website reading something, and then I'll get a pop-up that I need an account to view the rest of the content that I'm reading. So for situations like this, I recommend using a temp email to sign up for the account. You can use a browser add-on like Tempmail to get a temporary email address and then sign up for an account with that. And then that way, if you don't really care about the account or its data, something like this is perfect. You can just refresh it, get a new email address and use that for all of these different throwaway accounts. And if you literally have a different email account for each online service that you're using, it becomes literally impossible to track you through your email. As far as securing your accounts goes, you should use a password manager. That way you can use a different password for each account. And if one of these accounts were to ever get hacked or compromised in some way, then the password that the hacker gets will only be useful for that one particular account. 
If you're a normie, then I would recommend using Bitwarden as your password manager. But if you're willing to put a little bit more effort into your privacy and use a slightly more complicated but more secure tool, then KeePass XC is what I would recommend. So in conclusion, the best way to secure your online life is to use compartmentalization. Use unique email addresses, unique passwords, and if you find yourself using software, hardware, and services that are all made by the same companies, then stop. Break the shackles of their tech ecosystems and start using software and services that respect your privacy today.